Today, we're going to talk about the transiently hypotensive patient. These are some of the weirdest patients you're going to face in the emergency department. They may come in with a list of hypotensive readings from home only to be normotensive at triage. It's easy to look at a patient's long list of medications and anchor on his or her antihypertensives as the cause of the hypotensive readings. But before you do that, it's important to have a stepwise approach to ensure that you're not missing anything that could be life-threatening. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing you're going to want to do is to check and see if your patient has any wild cards. Is your patient immunosuppressed? If so, they may be hiding an infection and their only manifestation was that transient reading of hypotension. Has the patient recently had a, a surgery and as a result is hiding a postoperative infection or a complication that could be making them hypotensive? For a full list of wild cards, watch our video lecture on the topic under the basics section. Now that you've taken a second to consider the wild cards, let's go ahead and review the different causes of shock. Even though your patient currently may not be in shock since they're no longer hypotensive, this is still a good list to run through in your mind in order to help organize what your workup is going to be and to make sure that you're not missing anything that could potentially be life-threatening. The first type of shock that we'll talk about will be cardiogenic shock. Maybe your patient is presenting with new onset heart failure secondary to an atypical MI. Or maybe the patient had a recent URI and is now presenting with myocarditis. The second type of shock that we'll consider will be distributive shock. Maybe your patient is old and immunosuppressed and as a result is hiding an infection. And as we said earlier, the only manifestation of this infection was a transient episode of hypotension. Whenever you think of infection, I want you to think of the three most common places where infections develop, which is the lungs, the urine, and the skin. Be especially vigilant about this cause of shock, especially in your old or immunosuppressed patient. The third type of shock that we'll talk about will be obstructive shock. Maybe your patient had a massive PE, or maybe your patient is a dialysis patient and now is presenting with a pericardial effusion. The fourth type of shock that we'll talk about will be hypovolemic shock. Maybe your patient is having intra-abdominal bleeding from minor trauma that they may have not reported to you. Or maybe your patient ate something bad and as a result is having explosive diarrhea and vomiting. And finally, the last type of shock that we'll talk about will be neurogenic shock. Did your patient sustain some type of trauma that disrupted his or her sympathetic chain. Although that type of history should come out during the interview, it's always just something good to consider. Now that you have your differential, you can now focus your history and physical on these five different etiologies of shock. You'll remember to ask if the patient has had any chest pain, dyspnea exertion, or PND. You'll ask the patient if they've had any dysuria, hematuria, a productive cough, or any new rash. You'll ask them if they've had any recent travel or immobilization that could have led to a PE. And you can ask them if they've had any remote trauma, which will cover both hypovolemic and neurogenic causes of shock, as well as if there's been any consumption of potentially a bad burrito. On your physical exam, you'll be sure to listen for muffled heart sounds, to palpate the abdomen to make sure there's no evidence of peritonitis. You'll do a full skin exam to ensure that there isn't evidence of any new rash. So again, having a differential prior to seeing the patient will help you be more efficient during your history and physical exam.
This differential will also help you with your workup. You will remember to consider getting an EKG, troponin, and possibly a BNP. You'll consider getting a UA, potentially a chest x-ray, to look for a pneumonia. Maybe you'll calculate a well score and order a D-dimer if you're concerned about a PE, or do an ultrasound looking to see if the patient has a new pericardial effusion. You'll order a CBC to make sure that your patient isn't anemic and potentially coax to make sure that they're not immune anticoagulated. And if the right history and physical are given, you can get some imaging to evaluate for neurogenic shock. Of note, the ultrasound can also be used in the cardiogenic shock evaluation as well. When you're doing your cardiac ultrasound, you can assess the EF and see whether or not it's okay or if it's absolute crap. Now, you don't always have to do a million dollar workup on these patients that present with transient hypotension. It all comes down to the history, the physical exam, and whether or not there are any wild cards that should lower your threshold for ordering tests. The final consideration is whether to admit or DC home. This is always the hardest question to answer, especially in a patient that is now normotensive and had a negative workup. If the patient has any wild cards, you should consider admitting them for observation. These patients have a higher rate of adverse outcomes when discharged home. It is important to also weigh in what the follow-up of the patient will be. If the patient can be seen by his or her PMD the next day, then that can make the decision a little bit easier to discharge the patient home. Finally, have a conversation with the patient and the patient's family if possible. Believe it or not, most patients don't want to be admitted to the hospital. Tell them the results and explain to them your concerns and see if they want to be admitted or are DC'd home. If the patient doesn't want to stay in the hospital, then you have your answer and be sure to document in your MDM the shared decision making. If you end up deciding to admit this patient, just remember that this may be one of the harder admissions to call up. You may get pushback from your colleagues upstairs, but remember you need to advocate for your patient and do what's right for them. Studies have shown that patients with transient hypotension are at an increased risk for badness, so respect the recorded blood pressure. And that's about it. So I hope this lecture has been helpful in organizing your thoughts and your approach to the patient with transient hypotension. Thanks for watching.